At any rate, uh, I'm the lead pastor of Fusion Madison. So excited to be with you this morning. We're going to be over in Hebrews chapter 6 today. And if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and get those out. We've been in a walk through Hebrew series. And uh, I'm going to just jump right into this today because I got a lot to unpack. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm not going to use it. I got a lot to unpack today in Hebrews chapter 6. So we're going to get right into the word. Let's read together out of Hebrews chapter 6. It says this. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. Sounds very familiar to chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And of faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. Now, I want you to pay attention to verses 4 through 8, because this is where we're going to hang our hat for the majority of the time today. It says this, it is impossible, everybody say impossible. It is impossible, and, and, and as we read this, I want you to think about how terrifying the scripture really is. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming of age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. I don't know about you, but that scripture sends a chill up the back of my neck. Uh, I'll get into it in a moment. Land that drinks of the rain often uh, falling on it and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it far whom it is farmed, receive the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love that you've shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope Sure, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Men swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have uh, fled to take hold of, of the hope offered us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Firm and secure, it enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Father, right now, help me to handle this word in a way that honors you. It's your word, not mine. And I pray, God, that you would change our life with it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So here's the deal, gang. There's a reason that I told you to focus on Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 8. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 8, at times in my walk with the Lord, has absolutely terrified me. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't been terrified by Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 8, it's because you probably haven't read it enough. Uh, but there are parts of it and, and the verbiage of it on a very topical exposition of it where you're just looking at it for the surface. It's It's scary. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. Because it's as though they re-crucified Jesus all over again and subject him to public disgrace. I've read that scripture before as an, as an early believer, uh, and, and I've heard this preached so many different ways um, that it, it, it's terrified me before. It scared me because there are undulations in my walk with God. There are times where I feel intimate and close with God, like God's like right there. I pray, I mean, I feel like God hears me, God's, God's answering prayer, and God's doing things in my life. And then there's times where I'm like, Lord, where are you? I can't hear your voice. I can't see your hand in this. God, why do I feel so alone? And there are times even as a believer where if you're being honest, I'll be honest about it. There are times where the, uh, the, me, the me effort. My side of it, I haven't done so well. Anybody anybody can identify with that? We're like, uh, I know the right thing to do, want to do the right thing. And, you know, I'm like, Paul, why did I do the things that I 
will not to do and the things I will to do, those things I do. There are times where we struggle in our walk with Jesus. And when I read that scripture, as I read that scripture as a young man, I read it as, oh my goodness, I've sinned. There's no way out of this. I'm going straight to hell. And I thought my faith was fragile and I thought my salvation was, was insecure. And I want to I want to tell you, this is a scripture that denominations are formed on. I'm going to be real honest with you. There are many, many denominations formed around Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 8. What's a denomination? A denomination is a group of people that read scripture different than other people. And because of that, they set up camp over here. This group sets up camp over here. And they start to lob grenades at one another. And that's what a denomination really is. Okay. And so some people in interpret Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 8 as... As it is possible, it is possible for you to lose your salvation once you have gained your salvation. Okay? And some of you were raised that way. I was raised free will Baptist. I was raised and free will was in the name, right? I was raised that if you chose to walk away from your relationship with God, that you were able to be unsaved after you had become saved. Anybody anybody ever heard that before? Like it's maybe it's a different word for you. You heard the word backslide. You ever heard the word backslide before? Like it's possible to backslide. And then there's another group of people that were raised that no matter what you do, no matter whether you're actively serving the Lord or not, no matter no matter how, how good or bad things are, that it's impossible for you to, to, to lose your salvation. That it is that you are eternally secure in your salvation. And it doesn't matter if you got saved at six and lived like hell the rest of your life. Uh, at, at 70 years old, you've 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 done drugs. You've 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 uh, you've engaged with prostitutes. I, I mean, whatever it might. I've done all kinds of crazy stuff. Doesn't matter what I've done uh, because I was saved at six. I'm good to go. When I stand before him, he's gonna be like, nothing ever happened. There's a group of there's a group of, of people that believe that way as well. And those two things are actually denominations. In fact, I will tell you, there's Calvinists and Arminianists, and I'm not gonna get into the nuances and idiosyncrasies of that. But literally, those are two schools of thought, that you are eternally secure or that your salvation can be forfeited. I grew up in such a way that I believed my, – my granddaddy taught that salvation had a maintenance plan. Okay, He taught that once you get saved, you got to start walking it out with Jesus. You don't walk it out with Jesus, that you can literally fall in and out of relationship with God. And so I did somewhat believe that my salvation was, was insecure. Like I worried about once I got saved, yeah, the way I was raised, like if I got in a fight with Tara and I said some stuff that was a little bit too mean and would have bordered on sin, that if I had died after I had argued with her and had said you're a duty head or whatever I might have said to her, you know, I, I, some of you are like, that's so bad that you said that. Well, that's not that bad of a word. So uh, if, if I had said something like that, if I had died before we had a chance to get right, I would have went straight to hell. I, I, I believe that. I believe that if I, I I believe that if I was in traffic and I I got angry at somebody, some of you are looking at your spouse and and, and said some stuff that I might not have should have said, or maybe I honked my horn in places that I shouldn't have honked my horn. Or God forbid, some of you have given people the old New York number one, you know, when you're driving by them. Uh, I believe I was raised that if I did that. And, and, and died in that moment, I'm going straight to hell. And I believe that there was this in and out relationship with God. That, you know, I'm in fellowship with him, I'm out of fellowship with him. I'm in fellowship with him, I'm out of fellowship with him. I'm in fellowship with him. And I, 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 learned, I, I learned early that I was saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But I believed I stayed saved by the effort that I put forward after I was saved freely that now all of a sudden it's it's on my effort on my works and I struggled with that I don't know if you've ever struggled with that or, or, or not uh, the, the, the reason I think that can be difficult is all of us are in the same boat all of us need Jesus if you need Jesus raise your hand just say I need Jesus every day okay how, how, how many how, how many of you would say since I've received Jesus I have never sinned. So you're in the same boat. You're in the same boat. If if what I believed originally was true that my salvation was that unsafe and that my faith was that uh, that fragile, you'd be in the same boat as me. 
where if you sinned after salvation, that it, you are now unsaved, your, your, your security, there really was no security to what you believed. And there's danger, listen, there's dangers in extremes of either one of these beliefs. And some of you are going to want me to take a stance on this, and I'm going to preach through this in just a second. But there's dangers on either extreme. On this, on this side over here, where you're eternally safe, nothing you ever do could ever separate you from God, and your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and, 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 and we're saved no matter how we live, no matter. Listen, the, the danger over here is that people believe that they are saved no matter what, and they don't realize that whether or not it has to do with your salvation, sin never produces good things in your life. Like, even if, even if you're still saved, sin has never benefited anybody. Why? Because you might get to eternity because of the grace of Jesus Christ and the blood of the Lamb, but you need to understand sin has consequences on this earth, and you will experience the consequences. Salvation will not save you from the earthly consequences of sin whatsoever a man soweth, so also shall he reap. You might be saved after you argue with your spouse, but you still may end up in counseling. You might be saved after you put that needle in your arm, but you still may end up in rehab. You might be saved after you drink and get drunk and do whatever you did while you was drunk, but you still may end up in detox, and you may still kill somebody in a car, and you still may wreck a relationship or a marriage, and you might look at God and go, why is this happening? I'm saved. It's because there's consequences on this side to your sin. Period. There's no argument on that. There's no argument on it. Whatsoever man soweth, so also shall he reap. It's, it's the law, really, of even cause and effect. You do this, this is going to happen. You steal and get caught, you might be a saved thief. But you're still going to be a jailed thief. <laughs> Am I, if I'm lying, I'm dying. Yeah, you, 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 you might, you might cheat on your spouse, and 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 you might be, you might be saved from from adultery and saved from fornication, but you still may experience the old D I V O R C E. For those of you that struggle spelling, that's divorce. You may still go through some garbage in your marriage even though you've given your life to Jesus because salvation unfortunately does not produce weed killer to the seed that you've sown I've prayed for crop failure in my walk with the Lord Lord I know I sowed the seed allow the crop to fail Allow a blight to hit the crop, some bugs to come in. Allow it to get eaten as it starts to pop up. Please do whatever is necessary to make that crop fail. But the reality is, is you're going to have, so on this extreme, on this extreme, you know what? There's no effort required. There's no, there's, there's nothing of me that's required whatsoever once I accept Jesus. And, and, and listen, we can debate this all day long. That, that 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 to stay saved there's there's effort on your behalf i can i can tell you there is no debate on whether or not you will be sanctified and grow in your relationship with the lord if you don't put some effort in for sure you will not have everything god intends for you to have in this life you will not know blessing you will not know favor you will not know his voice you will not have clarity and direction if you don't start walking with him once he saves you from yourself on this side, on this extreme where you're eternally insecure, so you got eternal security, and then over here you got eternal insecurity where you constantly think about your effort and what you're doing and how good you are. It negates the finished work of Christ on the cross. And all of a sudden now you're working for your faith, and it's not bad to work for your faith, but you actually believe you're working for your salvation. And it's about your effort. It becomes about how good you are. The problem is, is even once you start to grow in him, you're good. It's never going to be good enough. Your best is never going to be better than what the son accomplished. You're still going to have to have grace come into your life repetitiously. See, the answer really is somewhere in between here. 
in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 8. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna rifle through this because I know some of you in here, some of you in, in, in here come from this school of thought, some come from that school of thought. Why do I know that? I know I came out of a denominational church. I started off with the Free Will Baptist Church. Then I went to an Assemblies of God church. And and, and both of those churches were Arminius in, in their belief. They believed that you could forfeit your salvation. But in a non-denominational church, as I've pastored for 20 years, we've had we've had Southern Baptists, which would fall more in the Calvinist uh, sort of d doctrine. We've had people that have come from the United Pentecostals. We've had people that come from the Methodist Church. I've even had ex-Amish and Mennonites in, 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 uh, underneath of, of my teaching, which is kind of cool because you get to rub elbows as a non-denominational church. You get to kind of like hang out with people you wouldn't normally otherwise hung out with. But everybody's got a thought on what that scripture says. And so doctrinally, they're like, well, where do you stand? And I'm going to tell you the, safe, the safest place to stand here at the very end, at the very end. But underneath the hearing of my voice, there's some people that believe that you don't have to do anything once you accept Jesus. And then there's people on the far extreme that believe that you literally can't sin or it's, it's curtains for you. It's over. Forget about it. You can't even be renewed. I want to talk to you about who this scripture is really talking to and kind of kind of present some proposals to you this morning as we get into this word. I know the Bible says essentially that they have been enlightened. Everybody say enlightened. They've tasted the heavenly gift. I don't I don't know about you, but have you ever have you ever tasted something but you really didn't eat it? Like what I mean by that is like you you got a little bit of it, but you didn't you didn't fill up on it. Come on, I, Doug Sharger's looking at me. I know you did it at Sam's Club. I know what you did. I do it at Sam's Club. Go over there on a Saturday. I'm tasting everything I can. 75 tastes of different things. All of a sudden, you feel like you've eaten, and you hit the food court right afterwards. We've tasted, all of you have tasted things, and what, if you didn't like it, you didn't eat any more of it, or you tasted it, and it was a sample, right? Like a little bit, a little something, something, and you just felt awkward about taking the whole plate of cheese from the Amish cheese barn, wherever you were at, you know? Uh, you, you, so you just tasted it, and it said, the Bible says they've tasted the heavenly gift. It says they shared in the Holy Spirit, and they've tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age. So there's definitely an argument to be made here. Like some people would argue, this is clearly talking to a person that has received Jesus as their Lord and Savior in Hebrews chapter 6. And the Bible says, the Bible says if, if, it, if it is somebody that's received Jesus, that once they fall away, it's impossible for them to be renewed into repentance. I don't know about you, but that scares, it scares the socks off of me. But the problem is, is does it line up with the rest of the word of God? Jesus said, Jesus, everybody say Jesus. Jesus, the letters in red, he said there's one unforgivable sin. One. One sin. And it's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't think the church has done a good job of dealing with some of the other problems that we can have in our faith because there are some other things that Jesus said. He said, if you can't forgive your brother his trespasses against you, then your father who's in heaven can't forgive your trespasses against him. So unforgiveness is really a kind of big deal with Jesus. Like we need to forgive one another if we've got problems with each other. And I don't want to not get to heaven because God can't forgive me because I didn't forgive you. I forgive you. If you've, if you've hurt me, I forgive you. Unless you owe me money. No, I'm just, I'm joking. I'm jo Nobody owes me money except for you. You owe me lots of money. I'm not pointing at my wife. That's dangerous. I was pointing at my eight-year-old. Settle down, people. Uh, listen, listen. Unforgiveness is a big deal, right? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, words in red. This is the only thing, this is the only thing that can't be forgiven. So here's the problem. Here's the problem. The rest of Scripture seems to indicate that if you have struggling points in your walk with the Lord while you are saved, that there's still a path for redemption for you. How do I know that? I know that because Paul talks to the Corinthian church, and Paul says, listen, if one of you is found in sexual sin, if one of you has a problem, you're cheating, you're, you're looking at stuff on the internet, if one of you is found to be in sexual sin, you call yourself a brother, it's, the Bible says in Corinthians, New Testament, expel the immoral brother, cast him out of the church. Some of you are like, man, I wouldn't even be allowed to be in church if, if we were following the New Testament. He says, cast him out of the church. He said, hand him over to Satan. Now, you might say, well, how is there redemption in that? 
Paul says, once they're found to be in sin, they call themselves a brother. Once they're found to be in sin, you give them over to the devil, and they'll realize, once they've been given over to the devil, they'll realize how much better it was to be in the house of God and serving the Lord. And the Bible says they'll come back. Paul puts in place a place for a believer who has essentially walked away the ability to come back. I have a difficult time reading Luke chapter 15 without seeing some redemptive quality to somebody who's fallen away. How many people by show of hands know what's in Luke chapter 15? Okay, all right, good job. Okay, it's because you were in here for a service. Luke chapter 15, familiar, familiar passage of scripture. It's the parable of the lost coin. It's the parable of the lost sheep. It's the parable of the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15 kind of gives us an indication of salvation, walking away, and coming back. Luke chapter 15, the parable of the, uh, of the lost sheep. The sheep, everybody go, bah. That's what sheep do. You just follow blindly. Uh, no, don't do that. Don't do that. It's terrible. You know, like I just, he just, I just got baited. Um, the lost sheep start off in the flock together. That's the, that's the beginning of the story, right? There, there's a flock, there's sheep, they're all together. One of the sheep wanders off, strays away from the flock. What that's getting at is part of the church, part of the body, one of the sheep walks away. The Bible says that the shepherd will leave the 99 and go after that one sheep and, and bring that sheep back into the fold. So here's the story. They're in relationship with the flock. They fall away from relationship with the flock. The shepherd goes, grabs that sheep, brings it back, and brings it back into relationship with the flock. To me, there's some indication there of a fall away. In Luke chapter 15, it talks about the parable of the lost coin. And I got corrected because I said him, but it's a her that had the coin, okay? I got to get my pronouns right. Um, anyways, um, so, sorry, bad, bad joke. Um, anyways, so in, in the parable of the in the parable of the lost coin, the coin starts off in possession of the person that has the coin. The coin is lost. The coin, the coin is valuable. And so the person that owns the coin tears the house apart looking for the coin. I under, I identify. I've lost my wallet before. You know how it feels, right? You tear everything up. Did you look here? Did you look here? Cars just <laughs> throwing stuff all over the place, or a cell phone. Who would have cared years ago, like when you lost the cordless phone, and like, whatever, I don't care. Now it's a cell phone. It's like, oh my goodness, I can't survive. <laughs> you start breathing bad, and, and you tear things apart. That's the value of this coin. Starts off in possession of the person that has the coin. The coin is lost. They tear everything apart. The coin is returned. That's the story. In possession, falling away, coming back. Luke chapter 15, parable of the prodigal son. Prodigal son starts off in the father's house. And inside of the father's house, he grows detesting toward his father. And he asks the father to give him his inheritance. He basically says, I want you to act as though you were dead and give me what's rightfully mine. The father obliges him. How many of you would do that if your kids said, hey, give me what's mine? I wish you were dead. Would you, would you, give, your kids, would you give your kids their inheritance? You give them something. You give them a closed high five. Um, that's a, you're going to use that for a new name for punching your kid in the face. Don't do that. You didn't get it from Pastor Aaron. Um, at any rate, you would say, no way. But the father obliges, gives that, gives that son what is rightfully his. The Bible says very clearly that son takes everything and goes to a distant country, squanders his money in what we call prodigal living, meaning that he was wrecked up from the neck up like he his head was not in the right space he did not do the right thing and the story ends the story ends with the son being the the furthest distance from his father that one could imagine because remember jesus is telling this story to the pharisees right he's telling this to, to jewish people and the story ends the climax of the story is the prodigal son is in the is in the is in the pit is in the slop with the pigs and eating the, the, the food that the pigs eat. Now, you need to remember Jesus is telling this to a bunch of religious Jews, and they're going, oh, my goodness, they're in the slop with the pigs? Now, I mean, they'd have been like tearing their clothes. I don't know what that was all about. They'd have been like tearing their clothes back then like, oh, that's so gross and bad, and that son is the worst piece of garbage that you could ever think of. And they would have been waiting, like 
what would, what, would, what would the father do if this son returns? And Jesus says, I'm going to tell you what happened. He cleans himself up, realizes he had it better in his father, father's house, and he starts his journey back. He fell away. He starts his journey back. And he said, when the father saw him, the father took off running. The Pharisees are probably sitting in the crowd thinking, all right, the father took off running. He's going to hit him with the high heat and clothesline him, right? Boom! You know, you, you went off, you stole my money, and, and you used it on terrible living, and you're an awful person. And no, to their dismay, the father embraces the person who has walked away from him, hugs his neck, puts a signet ring on his finger, puts a robe around him, and says to his other son, this son, though he was dead, is now alive. And he throws a feast and a party because the son who was lost has now returned. And so we read this scripture and we go, wait a second. In Hebrews chapter 6, it says if, there's, if this person falls away, that it's impossible for them to be renewed. But yet over and over and over, Jesus teaches that if you fail, there is still redemption for you. And so who is this talking to? And what is this talking about? Is this talking about blasphemy of the Holy Ghost? Is it, is it talking about that sin where somebody goes so far as to denounce the Holy Spirit? And some people worry about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Like, have I blasphemed the Holy Spirit? Let me just tell you, if you worry about blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you probably haven't blasphemed the Holy Spirit. People that blaspheme the Holy Ghost, they don't think about the problem of blaspheming the Holy Ghost. When you have, when you have walked with the Lord and you worry about, have I hurt his heart? Have I blasphemed? You probably haven't, okay? And so I don't believe that that's getting at this. The Bible says these people have been enlightened, tasted the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age. The overall teaching of the New Testament is that salvation is given. Given. Not earned. Not worked for. But given. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You do nothing to deserve salvation except believe in Christ. Since you did nothing to deserve it, is it possible that you have to do things that deserve to keep it? Ask yourself that question. He doesn't say that the people he's talking about have been sealed with the Spirit, born again, chosen, reconciled, forgiven. And over and over and over, Scripture uses those phrases. Those phrases are each used in multiple places when describing a person who has been saved. Here's what the author does say about those he's talking about. They've been enlightened. They've tasted the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age. What does it mean to have been enlightened? Everybody say enlightened. Scripture uses the word enlightened in other places. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. So enlightenment comes before you receive the hope of salvation. It takes enlightenment. It takes the Spirit speaking to you and leading you for you to even be saved. Ephesians 1.18 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. 2 Peter 1.19 says, and we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place. Somebody that's been enlightened is somebody that's had the light come on, and you can choose to walk in the direction the light's leading you, but you can also walk away from the light. Just because the light has come on doesn't mean you'll utilize its good, its good intentions. It doesn't mean that you'll walk according to it. The Holy Spirit can lead you in a direction, but that does not mean you will walk with him. It's still a choice. These people that this verse is talking to have been enlightened. They've shared in the Holy Spirit. They've shared in the Holy Spirit. What the scripture does not say is that they have They've had the spirit of truth living within them. John 14, 17 says the spirit of truth lives with you and will be in you. It doesn't say what 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, that we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, I am the church. This isn't the church. This is a building, bricks, sticks, and mortar. Most, most of this building's brick. 
I'll tell you right now, if there's ever a tornado, this is the place to be, okay? Bottom corner right over here. You'll be fine. I promise. It's all brick. The whole building's brick. But God doesn't live here when we shut the lights out. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. When, when you accept, and when I'm, I'm talking about when you walk with Jesus, when you've got a relationship with him, the Holy Ghost comes and lives on the inside of you. And instead of saying, I wish people would come to church, you need to understand when you walk out of the door, you're taking the church to them, baby, because you are the church. The Holy Spirit of God lives on the inside of you. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Bible also says in Ephesians 4.30 that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. This verse in Hebrews doesn't say anything about being the temple of the Spirit. doesn't say anything about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. doesn't say anything about being sealed with the Holy Spirit. This group of people that he's talking to are people that have partaken of the Holy Spirit. They've been enlightened. They've tasted. The word of God. Why is that important? Is it possible? Is it possible that this group of people. This scripture is talking to. And I'm presenting this as a possibility. Because I want to tell you where I stand in the journey. Is it possible that the group of people. That this is talking to. Are people that have been around God. Been around church been around the people of God, but never actually made a choice to follow. Made a decision to actually walk with Him. I believe that there are people in Scripture that live that way. Have you ever thought about the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples of Jesus we live by faith, right? We pray in faith. We prayed for little little Sophia. She's here today. I don't even I see Bailey, but I don't know where. Well, I, she's in class. Sophia's doing great. We prayed in faith. We prayed in faith the other day for Johnny as he went to the hospital. Johnny played the piano today. We've been praying for Carrie Ann. Carrie Ann's here. We pray in faith. The twelve apostles they didn't they didn't walk by faith nearly as much as we did. Why? Because the 12 apostles were with Jesus. They were there when Jesus took a little kid's lunchable and said, you know what, I'm going to feed 5,000 people with just a few fish and a few loaves. Hey, you, 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 got, you, got, uh, you got that little five, five, five nugget fish deal? And he's like, I'll feed everybody with that. And they start distributing as Jesus is, is lifting it up to heaven and blessing it and breaking it. And they, they just give it and give it and give it and give it. And all of a sudden, 5,000 people, not including men and, and or women and children, have eaten. And the Bible says they took up 12 fragments or 12 baskets of fragments after it was over. They, they, they saw the mighty right hand of God. They were there at the tomb of Lazarus. When Lazarus was dead and smelled, if you've ever smelled a dead body, Lazarus would have stunk. He was already dressed in spices and, and came walking out like a zombie when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. They were there when Jesus spit in the mud and wiped it on somebody's eyes and those milky color corneas turned into, it turned, turned into beautiful colored eyes and all of a sudden they were able to see. They were there. When he, when he healed the person at the pool of Siloam and, and, and he, they were there to see all this, all this stuff happen. They were there for all of it. And yet still one out of the twelve betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Was remorseful and hung himself. How can you be that close to God and watch it? And you're still just in a bump into relationship with him instead of an actual walking with him fellowship friendship. How is it possible that Judas was able to walk away from God after he had watched it all happen? Some of us in here take the attitude, well, if God would do this, I would believe. I'm going to tell you right now, it didn't work for Judas. Judas saw it all. And still, cash money did the job. He walked away. Is it possible? Is it po how does that how does that practically apply to us? It was possible in the New Testament to be close with Jesus, to know about Jesus, but to not know Him. It was possible to have met Him, but to not know Him. Let me say it the way that it really is today. It is possible to sit in church. And not be a Christian. 
The New Testament's full of people who walked with him but knew him not. And the church is full of people who attend church but know him not. In Mark chapter 5, one of my favorite passages of scripture in all the Bible, it's the story of the woman with the issue of blood. She, she, she had hemorrhaged for 12 years. 12 years she bled. You can take your mind and think about it. That's what, that, that's what it means. She bled. She hemorrhaged for 12 years. The Bible says very clearly she tried everything, spent all of her money, went to every doctor, went to, went to every physician to try to get rid of that problem. And then all of a sudden there's this, there's this I don't know, Jesus, Jesus is coming through sort of announcement. And she decides, I'm going to go and see what this, you know, what all the hubbub's about. And I'm going to go try to see this guy. My goodness, I've tried everything else. And so she takes that attitude. You know what? If I can just, if I could just touch his clothing, I don't even have to get to him. If I can just touch something that, 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 that's, that he's wearing, I believe that I'll be made whole. And so we get this picture of her like crawling, probably on her hands and knees, and she touches the hem of Jesus' garment, doesn't even come into skin-to-skin skin skin contact with him, and all of a sudden she's healed, right? We don't read too much about the story that preceded that and the story that, that, that follows it. But what it says is as Jesus is walking. He's walking to, to actually raise Jairus' daughter from the dead. Jairus doesn't know it. his daughter's sick. And that's Jesus is on his way. And the Bible says that the crowd is thronging and jostling Jesus. Jesus is at the center of a mosh pit. Okay? He's walked for those of you who don't know what a mosh pit is, don't ever get in one. Okay? They're, they're terrifying and they stink. Um, there's a lot of sweat. Um, he's getting he's getting thronged and jostled. Jesus is Jesus is having that that like, like that, that Michael Jackson moment. People are like, oh, Jesus! They're crying, they're they're thronging and jostling him. And then this woman touches him. Jesus stops. His apostles are with him. And Jesus says, who touched me? And his apostles say this. Jesus, you see the press of the crowd around you. You see how many people are walking around you. And you are going to ask us who touched you? How are we supposed to know? Here's the point. There's a lot of people that bumped into Jesus that day. Only one person got anything out of him. How come the woman with the issue of blood got what she needed from the Lord and the rest of them just thronged and jostled him? Nothing happened in their life. The difference was she reached out in faith. They were just fans. And the church is full of fans. It's full of people that are like, I love the idea of going to church. It makes me a better person. And I feel good about myself. And, and you know what? I just feel so lifted. And, and, and I don't know why I'm doing this voice, but I'm so, you know, I just feel good about myself. I'm a voice guy. I just, I just hey, you know, hey, hey, you know, they could do another one. I feel so good about myself, and, you know, it just makes me feel good, and, and the lessons, and I like that my kids like it. Listen, we're not asking you to be fans. Walk in faith, because listen to me. I want you to understand this. Being a fan of Jesus will not get you into heaven. How do I know that? Judas is a good example. The crowd's a good example. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23 is the best example. Words are in red, means Jesus said it himself. And this is what he said. Many will come to me. And on that day they will say, Lord. Lord. They call him Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name, drive out demons and perform many miracles. And Jesus said, I will look at them and say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. Jesus did not say when that person comes to them and says, Lord, didn't we drive out demons? He'd be like, yeah, you drove out demons. Things happen because the Spirit of God used, to, used somebody who might not have been who might not have been fully surrendered to me, God still allowed things to happen. Word doesn't return void, does it? This is how a sinner can speak the word of God and experience some of the blessing because the word of God does not return void. I know people that believe in the principle of tithing and they have blessed finances, but they don't walk with God in any other way. I read finance books on investing and, and real estate because I, I like to do that. And literally the principle of tithing is in most of the books. And they are not Christians. They're like, listen, I don't know why it works, but it works. Because the word of God does not return void. 
principles of God don't return void. So the reality is, he doesn't say, you know what, you haven't done any miracles in my name. He just says, listen, you might have done all that stuff, but I never knew you. Because you were a fan. But you weren't following. There's a lot of fans of Jesus. It's okay to be a fan and follow. It's, I mean, you know, most people that truly follow him are fans. But if you just stay a fan, you know what, God? I just, I want you to be a part of my life. God's not interested in being a part of your life. He's interested, listen to me. He's only interested in the driver's seat of your life. He's not interested in the passenger seat, the back seat. Some of you throw him in the trunk. He's not interested in just being a part of your life. He's interested in informing every single part of your life. And oftentimes we compartmentalize our life. I'm going to consult with God on this decision, but on this decision, this one's mine, baby. I'm making this decision, where I want to go, what I want to say, how I want to act, what I want to do, what I want to do on Saturday night. These are my decisions, and God's going, listen, don't think, don't think that I can't recognize a faithful follower and separate the wheat from the chaff and know a fan versus a follower. So where do I stand on this doctrine of it's possible to fall away or it's impossible to fall away. Let's keep lobbing grenades, you know. I believe this. I believe this. You're stupid. You're stupid. I don't, I, I don't think there's any reason to argue over it. I believe there's a much safer place to live. The reality of our salvation is confirmed by perseverance. The reality of our salvation is confirmed by perseverance. What do I, what do I mean by that? The Bible says he that endures to the end shall be saved. There's a race to run. And we're supposed to begin walking with him after we accept him. We grow the moment that we're planted. We expand. We start listening in obedience and start walking with hopeful expectation in the word of God and believing that he's going to do what he said he would do. I don't believe works keep you saved. I don't. I, I, don't, I don't believe that we accept this free gift from Jesus and then suddenly keeping it is on us. But I believe there are treasures in heaven that you will never open if you don't start walking with him. Things that you can't imagine. Good things, God things, plans, blessings, and, 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 and anointing that you could walk in for your life. All you can expect from sin is hell. And I'm not talking about going to hell. I'm talking about you can expect all that hell has to offer if you continue to walk in sin. On this side of eternity, in this life, if you continue to walk in addiction, you can experience the, the, everything that the devil wants for you. You, you. Listen, Jesus may have mercy on you at the end. That's his to sort out. But I'm going to tell you, it's not going to be the life that he has for you right now. You can continue to, 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 to cheat and, and to carouse and you can continue to, to go out on your spouse and think that, think that you're going to make it into eternity. But it's listen, hell is still going to be unleashed in your life now, right now. Because sin always has a cost. Whether sin determines your final sentence or not, I'm going to tell you it has a cost right now. And the person that perseveres until the end, that endures till the end, they'll be saved. Salvation has, you can do a heat check on your salvation. Lord, am I really walking with you? Am I really saved? I think we need to do that sometimes. I think we need to really test our faith. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, Paul in his epistle to the Corinthian church, he said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus in, is in you unless, of course, listen to this, you fail the test. It doesn't say that. Yeah, it does. Yep. It sure does say that. 
There are times we need to examine ourselves. God, am I in the faith? Am I walking faithfully hand in hand with you? Lord Jesus, am I, am I doing what you've asked me to do? Am I in obedience to you? It's not wrong to ask that. Why? Because the reality of our salvation, Pastor Josh, would you come, is confirmed also by producing fruit. You should be producing fruit. Hebrews 6, 7 through 8 says this. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it. We read this. And that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farm receives the blessing of God. But land that doesn't produce and produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. We are called to produce fruit for God. Matthew 7, 17, this is the words of Jesus. Every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. What happens to the bad tree? Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire, and thus by your fruit you will recognize them. Words of Jesus and read again, Matthew 13, the one who received a seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who receives the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. A true believer produces fruit. Now, we could get into the argument when somebody falls away, there's people that would be a, that, that would be a Calvinist and say, well, that person was never really saved. That's not my job. It's not your job to, to determine whether or not somebody was ever really saved. I've done this long enough to know that I've seen really good people that I definitely thought were saved fall away. So, I, or we could be over here and say, "Well, you, you, you know, you know what? You gotta, you gotta work out your your soul salvation with fear and trembling before the Lord, and you better get active in the church, and 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 and, and, and we're gonna we're gonna continue to press on you because we want to lead with fear and trepidation that if you don't do the right things." Listen, if you're not working for the church and you're not active, I don't know, it's over for you. Listen, the reality is this. Here's the safest place to be. Get saved. Walk with Jesus. It's the safest place. Get saved. And walk with Jesus. What do I mean by walk with Jesus? Learn to hear his voice and respond to it. Know his word and live by it. Like any relationship, when you feel like you've messed up, talk to him about it. The safest place to live is in his presence, in his will. And then there's no reason to argue and throw grenades about the safety of our security, you know, we're secure in our faith or the insecurity of your salvation. If you're walking with him, it's the safest place to be. I can tell you when my eight-year-old is with me, she feels like she's the safest place that she can be. Well, what do you mean? You mean like at home? No, no. As long as I'm there doesn't matter where we're at she feels safe because she's with me when you walk hand in hand with the father it doesn't matter where life takes you it doesn't matter what undulation you have in your walk with god it doesn't matter where where your career takes you or relationally where you're at you'll have ups and downs and peaks and valleys and as long as you're hand in hand with the father you're the safest place that you can possibly be and then According to Hebrews chapter 6, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. There's an anchor to your hope. Your hope has a rope, and it goes to the holiest of place, the inner sanctuary. The holy of holies is where the anchor of your faith is at, the place where Jesus is at. Now, our anchor is not on this side of life. It's on the next side of life is what that scripture is getting at. Now, I don't know if you have ever if you've ever been out on a lake. I don't know if you've ever dropped anchor before, but I can tell you I have. I've been in, I've been in fishing boats, and I've, I've been on boats that dropped anchor. I've been, in, I've been in ports of call on cruise ships and things like that. But I can tell you in a small vessel. I can tell you in a small vessel, you can drop anchor and you can physically not move very far, but I can tell you it can still be terrifying, even with the anchor dropped. The anchor drops, it grabs a hold of solid soil. You, you, you let the cleats grab a hold. But I'm going to tell you, man, all around that anchor, all around that, that, that point that doesn't move, that boat can move in 360 degrees around that anchor. 
It still experiences the chop of the water, and it still could be buffeted by the waves. But even though it feels like it's gone all over the place, it stayed stationary because the anchor hasn't moved. The boat's moved all over the place, but the anchor has kept it from going astray. The anchor's kept it from going too far. And I'm going to tell you in your walk with God, there are going to be times where you feel like, God, I've gone too far. And boom, the slack's going to come out of the rope. And God's going to yank you back because your anchor goes beyond this life into the next. Then you're going to feel him draw you back even though you feel like you've gone too far. Yeah, you might have circled 360 degrees around your face. You might have had moments where you were in or out. But the slack, it comes out, boom. The anchor grabs a hole. And it does not let up. It does not, it does not come undone. There's an anchor to your faith. Your hope is not your own. It goes beyond this life into the next. It's the reason that we're able to make it through. It's the reason that we're able to keep pressing even though things seem bad. That's the surety of our salvation. The safest place to walk is in lockstep with Jesus. Don't worry about eternal security or backsliding. Walk with Him. And those conversations are moot points. Get saved. And walk with Jesus. I'm going to have you stand to your feet today. Every head bowed. Here's what I know. We had a lot of people give their life to Jesus in the first service. We had a smaller crowd than this, but a lot of people gave their life to Jesus. A lot of people recommitted. Because what they realized is they've been the mosh pit Messiah followers. They've bumped into him. They've been in church. They've been a part of the fan club. They've got fan stickers and fan t-shirts and fan bracelets, but some of them realize today that, you know what, I've just been bumping into him, but I have not actually surrendered my life to him. And some of you, some of you feel like your faith is not working. I'm telling you, you what, your faith is not working because you're, sur not, you're not surrendering to him. You're compartmentalizing your life and saying, I want this to work, but I don't want to give this up. It only works when you say, God, every part of me, my thought life, my marriage, my who I am as a parent, who I am as a, a, a son or a daughter, who I am as a co-worker, God, I give it all to you. I give my whole life to you. I give my future to you. I give my past to you, God. I give everything to you, and I fully surrender. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you tell me to jump, I'll jump. God, I just want to be in step with you. That's when it works. I'm going to ask you, are you ready to transition from being a fan to a follower? If you'd be honest enough, this is between you and the Lord today. I want you to bow your head, close your eyes. I want you to be honest enough to say, Pastor Aaron, I, I genuinely believe in Jesus. I genuinely do. But I genuinely know that I have not surrendered to him. It's just areas of my life I just haven't given to him. And I know that today I need to do that. If that describes you, put your hand up and say, that's me. Amen. 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 Now, if you'd say, Pastor Aaron, I know, listen, I know I'm in relationship with him. But I'm like that ship. I know the anchor's there, but there's been a lot of slack in the rope. I've allowed myself to be blown around by the storms of life. and I've kind of been like that ship that's just been tossed all over the water. And I feel it. I feel it in my spirit. Man, I, there was a time in my walk with the Lord where I was white hot with him. I was just on fire for him and I have let I've let that flame grow down into a coal and I know that I need I need the wind of the Holy Spirit to come and to 
breathe back into life and back into fire my walk with the Lord. And I want to submit to him today that, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready. If that describes you, put your hand up and say, that's me. Amen. Amen. The Lord's moving here, man. The Lord's moving here. I want to pray for you. But I want to pray in such a way that we just, we know, that we know that today is going to be a different kind of day. No more games, guys. No more games. Let's go after him, man. You know what's great about God? If you chase after him, you can catch him. I don't know if you've ever went snipe hunting, but you ain't doing that with Jesus. You, you, go, you go hunt for Jesus, you're going to find him. You're going to get a hold of him. So I want to pray for you today that just like that woman who touched the hem of his garment today, you're going to get a hold of some cloth. You're going to get what you need from him. And it's going to seal the deal in your life. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for every single person that's here. God, there, there are no accidents in eternity. Every single person that's here is here by divine design. I really don't believe that anybody's here through their own planning or their own postulation, even though we might have come because a friend invited us or we might have come because this was a Sunday that opened up in our schedule. Realistically, God, you aligned everything so that we could be here today. And God, today we heard this message because this is what you wanted us to hear. And I'm praying for this group of people. So many have raised their hands, God. I am excited for them, Lord, to see what the Lord's going to do in their life when they walk in full surrender. I pray, God, that they would give you every part of themselves. That they would realize that by surrendering themselves, God, sometimes we fear what we're giving up and we don't realize what we're gaining. We're gaining everything. Joy. Peace, blessing, favor. God, you're going to provide for every need we have in our life when we surrender to you. So God, I pray that all those blessings and, and all those anointings would come over this house. I pray, Lord, that our house, our houses would be blessed because of the choices that we're making inside of this house. I pray, Father, that, that because we surrender to you, Father, we would realize what it is to walk in favor, what it, what it is to walk in anointing, what it is to lay our head down on the pillow at night and have peace. Thank you, God, for those that have raised their hand. I'm going to ask you, if you raised your hand, to give your heart to Jesus today. Everybody with me, repeat this. And just say, dear Jesus, I surrender to you. I'm giving you all of me. No more compartmentalizing. No more dark areas of my life. God, today, every part of me goes to you. Because Jesus you gave everything for me. Today, Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my heart and be the Lord of my life. No longer just a fan, but a faithful follower. Today, Jesus, you have all of me so I can have all of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, that we would be salt and light, a city that's set upon a hill that cannot be hidden. Use this group, use this church, Father, to impact this community and the world around us. Father, we thank you for all you're doing. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Hebrews 7.